In 2017, my family and I had an opportunity of a lifetime to travel to Yellowstone National Park. I mean, this was an incredible journey. In fact, uh, I don't know if you knew this, but Yellowstone was the first national park in the world. In fact, it was 1872 that President Grant would preserve this national treasure and declare it um, a national park. And what was amazing is the beauty of Yellowstone. I mean, you see some of the most amazing, iconic views. There's not a place in Yellowstone that you go where you're not uh, just surrounded by beauty. In fact, uh, um, you see the Grand Teton Mountains off in the distance over Lake Yellowstone. And uh, even at night, the moon is just gorgeous looking over towards the Tetons. And uh, what was really cool is we saw the Artist Point, um, which is the, the, the upper and the lower falls. And I mean, Artist Point is one of the, the uh, places that have been photographed and have been painted over the years. Hayden's Valley is another location that you'll see incredible amount of wildlife. In fact, speaking of wildlife, the animals are incredible. You'll see bison. In fact, the picture that you see here is a bison that, that roamed into our campsite. And we didn't have a chance to even jump into our van. Uh, we, we were literally uh, just trying to keep the, the van in between us and the bison. And he kind of circled around a little bit around our campsite. And then there's um, bears and eagles and wolves and, and elk. Um, the elk, in fact, were a little nosy in itself. So th this particular elk went right over to our meal. I was cooking chili on uh, the outdoor stove and that oak stuck his nose right up to the pot of chili. And uh, I guess it burned him and I made a noise, but the elk took off. Um, and then Peyton has a really funny story about a yellow bellied marmot that while the first day that we were at Yellowstone, we went hiking and we were going to the scenic overlook and all of a sudden Peyton was sitting on this uh, log and this little yellow bellied marmot just popped his head out and he looked at Peyton like, what are you doing here? It was hilarious. We were cracking up. She was scared. I mean, it was, she screamed and uh, the, the little yellow belly marmot ended up taking off and uh, it was just, it was an incredible experience. But the one thing that you have to take into consideration when you get out to Yellowstone are the geysers. The geysers are incredible, um, whether it's like the mud pots uh, that gurgle and bubble. Um, in fact, you know, Yellowstone sits on a super volcano. So the ground around the, the super volcano and, and around Yellowstone is superheated. And so a lot of that heat just rises up through the ground. And what's impressive about that is it ends up sometimes shooting water into these beautiful geysers. In fact, the Grand Prismatic is one of those particular geysers that is amazing to see. The colors are incredible. The heat that comes off of the geysers is really tremendous. In fact, uh, this is a picture of Kaylee and the kids and I as they were waiting for the, um, for the uh, we were going around to take a look at and check out the, uh, the geysers. And then also too, um, the granddaddy of them all, Old Faithful. So Old Faithful was amazing to take in. Uh, this geyser has been so, well, as it says, popular that and faithful that people come from all over to see uh, Old Faithful go off. And it recently has been famous because uh, somebody was arrested for trying to cook a chicken over top of the hole of Old Faithful. I don't recommend that. And, uh, and in fact, um, the reliability of Old Faithful is you can set your watch to it. What's amazing is they have an app that will tell you when Old Faithful is going off. Now, we didn't know about this app, so we just showed up anticipating that, like I've heard, like every 15 minutes or so. So this is us. There is nobody else around. And we could see little puffs and whiffs of clouds that, and steam that was coming out of Old Faithful. Um, but we were waiting for the big eruption and there was nobody around. In fact, somebody then came, sat down with us and they said, oh, are you guys here to see the Old Faithful go off? We said, yeah. And they go, well, it'll be another like 35 minutes. We were like, what? Another 35 minutes? Well, what are we going to do until then? And uh, here there is an app that tells you exactly when you can anticipate Old Faithful going off. So then crowds and crowds and crowds of people came uh, and then uh, Old Faithful erupted 180 feet in the air. 
is uh, the water shoots up 180 feet in the air and it goes off 20 times a day. Now you may be wondering, why are we talking about geysers? I thought this was a Christmas series. Well, it's because geysers remind me of our principal topic for this, uh, for our, our time together, and that's joy. Geysers remind me of joy because there's a bubbling up of joy that's taking place. And, and for many of us, uh, we, we, we tend to maybe think about things that erupt or, uh, um, you know, reaching a point where you can't contain yourself. And we tend to think about that in terms of anger. But what about joy? What if there was something that was gurgling inside of us, something that was bubbling up, and eventually it would lead to this explosion of joy and uh, the positive side of that explosion versus anger? Now, if we're being honest, everyone experiences joy differently. For some, it looks more like a mud pot and it just kind of burbles and it gurgles and it, you know, kind of plops up and every once in a while you, you, you feel that, that joy inside. For others, it's, it's that eruption. It's that old faithful moment where the joy, you just can't contain yourself and you've got to share. And then if we're being honest, that there's a group of people that struggle to find joy in anything. And it's really hard for them to even experience joy. But there's, there's one thing that's true about even all of those experiences. It's that joy starts under the surface. Joy bubbles up. It starts down low and works its way through to come out. Joy is the trait that we're going to be talking about. And in our Rediscover Christmas series, our Advent series, which means coming, it means arrival. It's our reminder that, that Jesus, uh, you know, it's his past and the present and the future and that Jesus will return one day. Each week we're focusing on a different attribute of God that's represented in his son Jesus when he came. Hope, peace, joy, and love. And through these different traits, the hope is that we will uh, relearn and rediscover the, the true value and the true meaning of Christmas. And that is despite our challenges, despite the hardships and the pain that we experience. And the reason for that, despite all of that, is because Jesus is Emmanuel, which means God with us. So this is a great place for us to stop. I want to encourage you to move to the started out section of your talk sheet, have a conversation about this topic of joy, begin the dialogue. And then when you're ready, uh, you can either continue in the message and in five seconds, it will automatically uh, begin, or you can just uh, press pause, have the conversation and then press play when you're ready to continue. Well, I encourage you to turn with me to Luke chapter 1. There's a lot of joy that's represented in the Christmas story, but I want you to hear something important. It's not separate from pain and disappointment. And I think that that's important. In fact, um, joy is birthed out of pain in the Christmas story. In fact, it's birthed out of long suffering and waiting. It's not one or the other. It's the joy that bubbles up and permeates through the pain and the disappointment. So I want you to look at two characters that we're going to take into consideration today, Mary and her cousin Elizabeth. We're going to get to them in a minute. But Luke's Christmas story actually begins before Mary and Joseph. We tend to think that Mary and Joseph are the pinnacle in their beginning of the story. But Luke actually begins with a prophet and his wife, Zechariah and Elizabeth. So as we turn to Luke chapter 1, we're going to look at starting at verse 5. And verse 5 through 7 reads, When Herod was king of Judea, there was a Jewish priest named Zechariah. He was a member of the priestly order of Abijah, and his wife Elizabeth was also from the priestly line of Aaron. Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in God's eyes, careful to obey all the Lord's commandments and regulations. They had no children because Elizabeth was unable to conceive, and they were both very old. Now, to the early readers who are taking in Luke's description of Elizabeth and, and uh, of Zechariah, they're learning quite a bit. There's a lot to learn here. In fact, they would have learned that Herod was the Roman king at the time. 
and that there was then great oppression that the people were experiencing in the land. It was very, very difficult. And then when we meet Zechariah and Elizabeth, we learn that they're from a priestly lineage. Now, this is important because it stands in contrast to the Pharisees and the Sadducees of the time. They were actually considered righteous in God's eyes. They were blameless. They were faithful. And that stands in juxtaposition of the Pharisees and the Sadducees who were more or less playing church than actually being the church. Now, what's interesting, too, is that uh, we learn from this particular scripture that they weren't just old, (laughs) but they were very old. And the other key piece is that they didn't have kids. Now, why is all that important? Well, because Gabriel, the angel, was going to show up and he was going to deliver news to Zechariah that was going to change his life. In fact, Gabriel shows up and says, you will have a son. You will pro- and he will proclaim the coming of the Messiah. Now, what's really interesting is Zechariah says back to Gabriel the equivalent of, yeah, right. That's literally basically what Zechariah says back to Gabriel. And then we go down to verse 20 and we look at Gabriel's response. He says, but now, since you didn't believe what I said, you will be silent and unable to speak until the child is born. Now, Elizabeth She must have been a little bit more believing because she responds to Gabriel in a much different way. Verse 25 says, How kind the Lord is, she exclaimed. He has taken away my disgrace of having no children. Now, what's interesting to note here is in verse 24, we're told that Elizabeth went into seclusion for the first five months of her pregnancy. Now, typically, when you're pregnant, you get to that first trimester, you tell everybody. You know, you start doing the baby bump pictures, you start, you know, posting on your Instagram and your and your Twitter feed and your Facebook, and you just begin really telling people because you made it past that hurdle of the first trimester. Instead, Elizabeth does the opposite. She goes into seclusion for five months. Now, the reason for this is probably because of the shame that she experienced of going through her whole life not being able to have children. Not having children would have been a major source of pain and sorrow, and shame for Elizabeth. In fact, I want you to think about from the perspective of Zechariah and Elizabeth, when they were young, they had all of these hopes to start a family. They had all these dreams of of what they were going to do as being a part of this priestly lineage, and they were going to pass that down to their children. And then over time, that hope started to fade because they weren't getting pregnant. That joy started to be squelched. And a lot of times, people in town would have started talking about them, spreading rumors. They would have said, well, Zechariah and Elizabeth, they must be out of favor with God because, you know, she's barren. I mean, at a certain point, you then are declared barren. And the shame that you carry around with that title is, is incredible. So, we fast forward to Elizabeth now being six months pregnant, and Gabriel is about to show up to another woman and deliver some life-changing news to Mary. Mary now accepted Gabriel's words more willingly. She was, of course, blown away, but there's still reality to take into consideration. Mary was now pregnant, but she wasn't married. She was going to have to explain to Joseph who he himself didn't quite understand and and wasn't on board at first they would she would i mean just think about how she would have tried to explain that to the people in the community no 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 i am pregnant yes i know but it's 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 not joseph's no joseph and i weren't intimate actually it's god's um it's god's baby well that would have cleared it up i mean so there's so much going on here and maybe that's why luke points out mary's excitement to connect with her cousin Elizabeth, because surely if anybody would uh, feel that excitement and, and burst with joy, it would be Elizabeth to understand. Because at this point, Mary would have known that Elizabeth was pregnant. Now Mary was pregnant and they get to be pregnant together. How awesome is that? And uh, so Luke 1 verse 41 says, all the sound of Mary's greeting, I'm sorry, at the sound of Mary's greeting, Elizabeth's child leapt within her and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. 
Elizabeth gave a glad cry and exclaimed to Mary, God has blessed you above all women, and your child is blessed. Why am I so honored that the mother of my Lord should visit me? When I heard your greetings, the baby in my womb jumped for joy. You are blessed because you believed that the Lord would do what he said. Now, there is so much to take away here, but I'm going to focus on three specific things. The first one is, it's okay to be joyful, and it's okay to be happy. In fact, over the years, many people have split these two uh, emotions. Happiness for many is declared fleeting and, and temporary, where joy is kind of seen as being deeper and longer lasting. And the trouble is uh, Christianity for years has actually classically split these two in kind of a negative way, kind of declaring that happiness is more of a worldly feature or it's something that the world uh, promotes, but we are supposed to be more joyful because joy is uh, a more of a spiritual term. Well, I want to share with you that the Bible actually never splits these two. The Bible doesn't do that. Now, Christianity might have done that, but the Bible doesn't. In fact, it's okay to feel both. It's okay to feel both happy, and it's okay to feel joyful. In fact, um, <laughs> the problem is for some that joy has been sucked out of us because of busyness, because of guilt, and because of obligation. And especially during this Christmas season. There's so much joy that's a part of the Christmas story, and there's so much joy during this time of year, but yet because of the busyness, because of the guilt, because of the obligation, it's kind of sucked out of us. So the question I have for you is, do you want that joy back? And if you would say, yeah, I want that joy back, then I'm going to teach you a really powerful word that you can use to get that joy back. Are you ready? Write this down. No. Say no. If you want to get the joy back, Protect yourself and say no. Pause. Use this Advent time as a season of pause. And instead, embrace joy. Find that joy in the story. Find that joy in the journey. Now, for those of you who find Christmas to be painful and difficult, you're not, and you're maybe you're, you're, you're listening to this and you feel discouraged by everything that has happened this past year. I want to give you permission to revel in this season. I want to give you permission to put all of that on pause and to seek the greatest and greater joy that is surrounding you today. Because it is, but we have to search for it. And so my point is, our longing and our happiness uh, and our, 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 our joy that we want to experience, it's hardwired into our DNA. So it's okay for us to be joyful and to be happy. Now, here's the second point. Joy is our strength. Joy is our strength. A great example of this is Nehemiah, who was an Old Testament prophet, and he had the incredible task of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. And this was a huge task because Jerusalem was desolate. It was decimated. And the people of Israel at the time, as, Jer as, as uh, Nehemiah is trying to explain to them that, hey, we're going to go back and repair the walls, like this should be a joyful time. The people, as scripture says, were weeping. They were, they were scared. They were tired. And in the midst of all of that, Nehemiah says something very interesting to them. He says, go and celebrate with a feast of rich foods and sweet drinks and share gifts of food with people who have nothing prepared. This is a sacred day before our Lord. Don't be dejected and sad. For the joy, now this is important, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Even in the pain, even in the discomfort, even in the, the tribulation, in the trial, in the sorrow, he's telling them to uh, rejoice and you need to uh, find the Lord to be your joy and your strength. You ask, well, how? How can the, the Lord, how can the joy of the Lord be our strength? Well, here, I want you to hear me say this. When you don't have joy, use God's. When you don't have joy, use God's joy. God has enough joy to go around. And when you feel depleted, when you feel like you don't have any joy, 
you lean on the foundation of God and you lean on God to supply the joy and to remind us that that joy will provide us strength. Now, Peter would describe it this way in 1 Peter. He would say, you love him even though you have never seen him. Though you do not see him now, you trust him and you rejoice with a glorious, inexpressible joy. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. This is the type of joy that I'm talking about that bubbles under the surface. It's inexpressible and it doesn't come from you. It's not something that you can manufacture. It's something that we realize that the joy of the Lord is our strength, that the, that, that the Lord's joy is what pushes up through the pain and through the loss and through the disappointment. Now, I want you to hear me. This is not a don't worry, be happy sermon. In fact, this is a sermon that is based in a whole lot of reality. And, and I want us to realize that we can find joy even in the pain, but it does take our choice. We have to make the choice to do that. And that leads me to my third point. We can choose joy. We can choose joy. So what does that mean? Well, rejoice is used a lot in the Bible. In fact, it's a very biblical word. We don't find this word rejoice much in culture. It's usually connected to something biblical. But rejoice is the verb form of joy, meaning it's the action, it's the, it's the feeling of joy. So I want you to look closely at the beginning prefix of this word. The prefix is re. Now I want you to think back to your grammar class. We're going to do put your, your grammar hat on. And I want you to remember, see what I did there? The prefix re means once more. It means again. It means return to. So if we put all of that together and we have this better understanding of what does it mean to rejoice, rejoice is to return to joy. So think about how often we have the opportunity to rejoice. That means that we're going to return to joy. And if we know anything about joy and that we can't manufacture and it comes from God, then that means that we are turning back to God. We are turning to Jesus to supply the joy of our salvation, to, resply, to, to, to uh, supply the joy that we need in this world. And we pray, and I pray, that it bubbles up through the surface of disappointment and pain, and that joy can actually take over because the Lord is, and the joy of the Lord is our strength. So we're going to pause here, and uh, this is a great spot to uh, go to the Talk It Out section of our talk sheet. And uh, if, if you're not familiar with our talk sheets, you just go right on trinitynazarene.org, and right at the top, there's a, a Trinity Anywhere tab. You click on that, scroll down to the bottom, find today's message, and you can download the talk sheet um, to enjoy the content and discussion. So again, if you want to continue in the message, just allow the message to keep going, and in five seconds, it'll automatically start. Or if you press pause, dialogue, discuss with the group, and then when you're ready, just press play and we'll be back. So no matter if things are terrible or things are great, none of us can conjure uh, an unending supply of happiness and joy. Like I said earlier, we just can't make that on our, on our own. In fact, it doesn't eliminate the fact that we're going to have bad days. And that's why the re is important in joy, to rejoice, because it's a reminder that we are returning to Jesus daily, that we are returning to Jesus constantly and to recognize that the source of our joy is like refilling our tanks and restoring our strength and renewing our spirits. That's what it's going to take. If we don't have joy and we feel empty and depleted, we have to go to the one who can refill that tank for us. Jesus' brother James, who uh, wrote the book of James in scripture, he actually famously said, consider it pure joy when you face trials of many kinds. Consider it pure joy when you experience trials of many kinds. I had to say that again because I know maybe this is the first time you're hearing that scripture and you're going, well, that doesn't make sense. In fact, that's bonkers. 
if we think about it. Consider it pure joy when we go through trials. And again, I have to admit to you, it sounds dumb. But joy feels so far away in the trials, doesn't it? I mean, that, that we, we feel like when we go through trials, joy is the last thing that, that's on our mind. Now, I want to encourage you with something. James isn't saying to be happy about our trials. It's not what he's saying. In fact, he's saying that with Jesus being the source of our strength, we have the opportunity to find joy even amidst the trials. That's what James is saying. He's not saying to be happy like, oh, thank you, sir, I have another. No, it's not what he's saying. He's saying that if Jesus is the foundation and if he's the source of your joy, he's the source of your strength, that even in the midst of those trials, you can find that joy to begin bubbling up again through that pain and through that disappointment. In fact, I just read this, uh, this week in Psalm 75, verse 3. When the earth quakes and its people live in turmoil, I am the one who keeps its foundations firm. Boy, doesn't that sound really familiar. When the earth quakes, when people are living in turmoil, where can we turn to find stability? Well, the psalmist is actually telling us right here that the Lord is the one who keeps its foundation firm. And the only ability to find joy in the journey is Jesus. That's it. And like I mentioned before, it's okay to be joyful and happy. It's joy is our strength and can be our strength. And ultimately we can choose joy. So let me ask you this question. What do you need to ask God in order to restore the joy of your salvation? Quietly, I want you to think about that question. What is it that you need to ask God to restore the joy of your salvation? Because if he's the only one that can restore that joy, then it's time to return our hearts to him, to know that he wants to answer that prayer. Here's the second question. How can you bring joy this week? How can you bring joy to a person how can you bring joy to a community? How can you bring joy to your neighbors or neighborhoods? How can you bring joy to your family? I want you to think about the action. This has got to be an actionable item that we then declare, not only is Jesus the joy of our salvation, but we're going to do something with that joy. And we want to be, whether it's a mud pot or the grand prismatic or old faithful, it's going to spring out of us. And it's going to be something that just starts under the surface and people are going to recognize because they're going to get wet. They're going to get wet from the, from the joy that is uh, coming out of you and spilling out uh, of you. So let's rediscover Christmas. Let's rediscover joy. Let's rediscover the joy of Christmas and embrace joy. And remember the source of our joy and return to that. Remember that God desires to be the source of that joy and return to him. And, and let's be like Zechariah and let's be like uh, Elizabeth and let's be like Mary and Joseph and the shepherds. And when the angel comes and when God speaks to us and, and gives us news, let's heed the word of great joy and, uh, and consider how God wants to fill us with that joy even today. Would you pray with me? Gracious Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for being uh, the joy of our salvation. Lord, thank you for supplying that joy that we need in order to uh, um, see how, even through the pain and through the suffering, Lord, I can't even imagine the, the pain that Elizabeth was experiencing and that Zechariah was experiencing. But even in the midst of that, joy was evident as, it, as it, they returned their hearts back to you to know that you are the God of the, even the impossible. Lord, I pray for each of us this morning as we uh, um, or that we uh, would return to you to find that source of our joy. And as we experience the incredible joy of the Christmas story, let us remember where that joy comes from. And we thank you for this, and we pray it now in your name. Amen. Well, as we end our time together, one of the things that we love to do each time is just to simply declare this blessing, this benediction. And so I encourage you, as you are uh, viewing this content, that you would say this benediction with me as it's here on the screen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. 
May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen and amen. You are sent.